uh, were not able to join this evening, there will be a, a video on our website to be able to, uh, you know, listen to later, right? So that's good. So David, it was such an honor for you to have accepted our inv my invitation to uh, speak for us. And uh, I will not take any more time to, uh, to allow you to uh, say what you need to say because it all sounded good to me. <laughs> so please go ahead and uh, uh, talk about your journey into uh, interviewing near-death experiencers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is David Such, AKA Jim Cleveland. I'll respond to either one tonight. So it is just this, it's such a joy for me to interact with the kind of people who would be in a group like this. Because as many of you know, who've had near-death experiences, when you talk about what you know and what you experienced, you get first the look, and then there's this progression of thought, this person's crazy, and therefore they're unstable, and therefore they're dangerous, and I want to get away from them. <laughs> and I can pretty much say anything I want here, and the people here are very open-minded, very high uh, spiritual vibration, and it's just wonderful to be able to be myself and talk freely. So I'm grateful to all of you. How did I get started? Well, I am a retired engineer, and many years ago I was working for a large utility, the largest in the, the nation here in the U.S., um, Semper Energy. They own SoCal Gas and Gaxon Electric. And I did a lot of work in putting things into data sheets. I analyzed the economic feasibility of small-scale power plants. And, and I'm the kind of person that, Back then, if somebody said they were psychic, I would in my head say, well, that means you're psychotic, you know? <laughs> so I didn't believe in any of this stuff. I kind of believed a little bit from my Catholic Christian religion, but you know, I, I doubted it. I was very afraid of dying. And I came down with chronic tendonitis in my body. And it started in my hands in 1999, and it got worse, and it got so bad that eventually I was confined to a mobility scooter. I, I couldn't be on my feet more than you know, five or 10 minutes. Uh, with, without pain. And it wasn't really till just a year ago when I moved out of the big city and into the country and into, into nature. I healed almost completely. I can walk. I walked uh, six miles yesterday. So, you know, there's hope when you, when you follow that intuition and uh, because Mother Nature and, and our spirits are always guiding us towards solutions. But back when it was really bad, um, I was out of work for a, a while. And if I sat down too long, it hurt. If I if I lay down too long, it hurt. And so I would go back and forth from the bed to the to the, my chair. And I clicked on a YouTube video. And it was about a man who, who was an atheist and he died. He kind of had a hellish NDE. He called out to Jesus for help. Jesus came, got him, and brought him to heaven. And uh, that really changed things. Because when that happened with my, with my tendonitis throughout my body, I had been prayed for by dozens of churches, hundreds of people. And I came to a conclusion. And it's, it's still hard to talk about it today. I thought, well, one of two things is true. Either there is a God, uh, but he doesn't care about me, you know, because I'm not a good Christian. I'm not a good Catholic. Uh, or maybe there's no God. But it's probably that there is a God, but I'm not a good. He doesn't like me at all. And that was a painful conclusion to come to. When I saw that testimony, that man who spent his whole life as kind of this tyrant yelling at people, I mean, You've all met somebody like that. And Jesus was bringing him to heaven and he, he felt horrible. He said he felt like garbage, filth, scum. And, and you could see he was being brought towards this good place. And Jesus stopped and he said, you belong here with us. We don't make mistakes. And when I heard that, I knew that, that I was never abandoned by, by God. I was never abandoned. And uh, I started researching near-death experiences. I found his testimony so interesting. That was, that was Howard Storm's testimony. Some of you are probably familiar with that. So I started doing one after another, and then I started talking about it, and I started hearing people say, oh, so-and-so that happened to, and it just kind of snowballed. And I started interviewing people. Uh, I remember even when I bought a, a car, the salesman was missing an arm, and I asked him what happened. He said a water skiing accident. He fell, and a boat behind him ran over him, severed his arm. He arrived DOA at the hospital, and I said, well, did you go through a tunnel? Did you see a light? Did you just love? And he you saw it too? <laughs> no, I've never had a near that experience. But after many years, it completely transformed my life as it's transformed the lives of many of you. Just, just studying what you say has been transformative. 
uh, it transformed the way I, I deal with my family. I always uh, had problems with my family members and now we get along great. It changed my political views. It changed the way I view nature. Um, it just, it enhanced and made better almost every aspect of my life. And so I'm grateful for all of you who have been brave and shared your testimonies because if it weren't for you, I, I don't know where I would be today. So let's go over what the near-death experience is like. And for those who have had them, many of you are familiar with this. Now, not all of these elements are experienced by every person. Heaven creates an environment to make the individual feel comfortable. The lengths they go through to just make us feel good is incredible. So if you're a nature lover, you may end up arriving in a park, one of heaven's parks. Um, if you have a certain religious perspective, you may be met by a certain individual. One guy was a big fan of the apostle Peter, and he was greeted in heaven by Peter, who <laughs> he said was a bit shaggy looking. So they, now they can appear any way they want, but they tend to appear the way they did on earth for our benefit. Um, so how do we know that, first of all, these um, experiences are not the trick of a dying brain? I'm sure some of you get told that, oh, you are hallucinating, you are imagining, it's a trick of the dying brain. There's scientists that say, you know, when you die, your, your cones that sense light um, sort of all die and tend to focus in. And so that's why you see a light. And they also say your brain re releases all the serotonin and dopamine, and you, you know, that's why you feel good. Well, for anybody who's studied near-death experiences, that just doesn't hold water. There were children who were taken through heaven by a, a grandparent or a great-grandparent. And uh, I remember one little girl, she was shown a picture of her great-grandfather, who she, she said had taken her through heaven. She says, no, that's not him. That's not him. Were you sure it's your grandpa's daddy? Yeah, but that's not him. Well, finally, she saw months later a picture of him when he was young. And she got all excited. Yeah, that's who took me through heaven. So. Uh, there are other people who've been blind since birth. Of the thousand plus testimonies I've heard, three were blind since birth. And they described seeing colors and they could say, well, this person had the same color shirt as that person, but they couldn't say what color it is because they never learned what color goes with what thing they're seeing, right? Um, there are people who were told about their, what's going to happen in the future before they came back. Uh, people come back with enhanced psychic. Uh, and empathic abilities. Some people, while they were dead, they can tell their other family members the way. Hello, uh, Bethany, we're having some problems here. I see that. I think David's um, connection has become unstable. All okay. Right. He's so back. I'm okay. back. So I'm going to, if it happens again, let me know and I will meet yeah. the, uh, the video. Okay. But hopefully Thank you. So, uh, what was the last thing you heard? Okay. We were talking about the changes. Um, so, uh, blind people seeing for the first time. Uh, the one woman said she was terrified because she had never seen before, but then when she got used to it, it became very beautiful. Um, people describing conversations that happened in another city because their spirit traveled there and they heard their relatives talking about, oh, you know, Aunt Martha died. And so a trick of the dying brain doesn't cover that. And then these people come back completely transformed. They come back more altruistic, less materialistic. They tend to be focused on loving relationships as opposed to whatever they were chasing before, whether it was money, fame, career, a certain hobby. Now they're interested in love and serving humanity and, and community and relationships. Uh, people change their jobs. Uh, one man who was an atheist became a pastor in the Church of Christ. Another man who was a billionaire he came back, gave up all his ties with the, the finance industry and became a, a marriage and family counselor. Another man who was a policeman said, I'm not going to carry a gun anymore. I'm not going to shoot somebody. And he became a high school teacher. And one man who was involved in organized crime gave all that up and became a counselor for, for delinquent youths who were having issues. So that's not something a hallucination does. And as those of you who have had NDEs know, 
the NDE is far more real than this world. So, if, you know, when you're having a dream, you think it's real, and it's only when you wake up and you go, oh, this is the real world. That was just a dream. Well, if you can imagine taking one more big step, step up in a level of consciousness, that's what the afterlife is like. It's far more real than this world. But we're going to always have to deal with people talking about a, being a trick of the dying brain. Um, you know, I like to tell people who have had NDEs, don't be afraid to share your stories. People are going to call you crazy. And over 500 years ago, Nicholas Copernicus wrote his book on the revolution of the celestial spheres. He worked out the math. We're not the center of the universe. We're actually going around the sun. And everyone thought he was crazy. He had to delay the publishing of his book till after his death because of the political and social firestorm it was going to create. And back in um, the late 1700s, the first uh, uh, archaeologist who found giant bones, and he said, I believe the giant lizards once roamed the earth, and he called them dinosaurio. And everybody thought it was a hoax. They laughed at him. And even, uh, I think it was Alfred Wiegand in, um, in 1912, who first suggested the continents were drifting over the surface of the earth, he was laughed at by the scientific community. So just because people laugh at you that doesn't mean it's not true. This is a truth that's going to be known by the entire world in less than 100 years. Everybody's going to be aware that near-death experiences are real and that we're little facets of God down here incarnating and we've done it before. It's just going to take time for the rest of society to catch up. So if they laugh at you for what you say, just remember you're in the company of some great people, some great discoveries. So what is the typical NDE like? Well, a person dies and sometimes they're out of their body at the scene of an accident or maybe in the hospital, they see themselves from above and they sometimes try and communicate with people and they can't. And now people say, well, were you a ghost? Well, no, you're, you're the opposite of a ghost. You feel more alive than you ever felt. And they quickly give up on that and something gets their attention, usually behind them or off to one side. And they look and they see a light, a little pinpoint of light. And they quickly get drawn to it like a magnet. And uh, they get into this light and it's 10,000 times brighter than the sun, but it doesn't hurt their eyes. They describe a warmth, uh, not a temperature warmth. Uh, some have described it like just being hugged by the universe. I've heard it over and over and over again. I've never experienced it like some of you have. I mean, as an engineer, I could study every aspect of Disneyland. I could know every nut, every vault, every employee, how the rides operate, how much electricity is used, everything about the park. And I would still know less than a 10-year-old child who spent one day there and knows nothing about that. That white light, there are no words to describe it. it it's beauty beyond human words. We can try and use a few analogies, and I'll give you what some people told me. One man said, imagine the 100 happiest moments of your life and put them all into one moment, and you still don't come close. Another man said, imagine the strongest love you've ever felt and multiply that by about 500 or 1,000, and that's what it's like. There's a feeling of love, of joy, of bliss, of awe, adoration, safety, purpose, that anything that's happening down here has a purpose to it. One of the things I hear over and over again is people say there's a perfect plan. It's working itself out in its perfection. Well, it doesn't seem like that from down here, but, but it is. So at this point, some are told it's not your time. You have to go back. Some are given a choice. However, they're very smart up there. So, you know, Anybody who sees that light, who sees heaven, who's been there, wants to stay forever, no matter how good their life is like on earth. I remember one man telling me, you know, if you had a genie, you know, lamp, magic lamp with a genie, and you could have all the wishes you want, you wouldn't be anywhere close to as happy as you are up there in heaven, right? So nobody wants to go back, and they show them what the benefits would be for themselves and for humanity if they return. And of course, if I heard their testimony, they chose to return. Uh, coming back can be very difficult and we'll get into that later. Now, some people, when they're there, it's every NDE is different. Uh, some speak with the light, others it's relatives that died before them, others it's um, spirits or angels or guides. So every, every NDE is different. 
Now, some people uh, see gardens. One man said he was in this beautiful park. And I asked him, I said, well, how beautiful, like Yosemite? And for those of you who don't know, Yosemite National Park is a, is a very beautiful park, one of the world's most beautiful parks in California. People come from all over the world to see it. And the guy said, let's see, uh, well, maybe, maybe 100 times more beautiful than Yosemite. So the beauty of the place is amazing. Uh, there are many different realms in the afterlife. And I'm only going to talk about the realm that's kind of laid out like Earth. And some people see this, not, not most. Most people at ND do not see this realm. But I understand there are realms to get people used to sort of the afterlife. So there's a realm sort of laid out like Earth. They have roads and houses and buildings and cathedrals and waterfalls and trees and mountains and parks and rivers and lakes. But the cities are gorgeous. One woman, she was eating something that was like a peach and she threw it onto the ground and the seed just dissolved. It's a self-cleaning place. They have trees that tower higher than our highest redwoods and sequoias. And they have just beautiful parks and flowers and you can communicate with all the plants and all the animals that are there. A lot of people ask me when I talk about near-death experiences, they say, well, will my pet go to heaven? I lost count. How many times people met their former pets in heaven? So yeah, you're going to see your pet again. So they're there and they all kind of go up there and they wait for us. They wait for the people they know to, to show up and they play together and they're happy while they're waiting for us. And you can talk to your pets. So people have had conversations with former pets. People have had conversations with plants. And so the whole place is alive. And let's talk for a moment about the senses. First of all, there's no blind spots, so we lose our vision right around here somewhere. We can't see behind us. In the afterlife, you have 360 degree vision, okay? Now you do have hearing far beyond the tones that we hear, but it's generally, speech and hearing are generally not used for communication. So there's a kind of communication that's mind to mind. It's impossible to have a communication mistake. And you can text somebody a message and they can misinterpret it. Now that doesn't happen there. And it's nonlinear. So you can get just one download of information and it might take you a day, a week, a year to explain this to somebody. So it's very efficient communication up there. Now, the sense of hearing, again, is not really used for communication. It's more for the beautiful music of heaven. I think the best description of the music of heaven came from Don Piper's book, 90 Minutes in Heaven. He was a pastor who had a car accident, died. And his most memorable part of heaven was, was the music. And he described it as just this chorus of many different songs being sung at once. You know, if we sang 100 songs at once, it'd be a jumbled mess. Well, up there, it was in perfect harmony. And it just filled him with beauty. And he felt like he was part of the music. And he didn't sing, but he knew if he did, he would sing in perfect harmony with all the other songs that he heard. And he really loved the music of heaven. So. Heaven really is a buffet for the senses. People in that first realm of heaven where they have their bodies, now in your natural form, you're a, you're a being of light and energy, like the angels. Um, but you can, you can choose to have your body, and most people choose to be in their mid-20s or early 30s, so people look great. I remember one woman, she said, well, I got there and I met my grandmother, and I knew it was my grandmother because you just have a knowing but she says, I wouldn't have recognized her by the way she looked because her grandmother was, you know, gray hair and she had no teeth and wrinkled skin. And she was hunched over. And this was a beautiful 25, 30 year old woman with long, dark hair. And she smiled and had a full set of pearly white teeth, you know. And so, you know, if my grandkids tell me, oh, you're getting older, you know, grandpa, I just say only for a little while. And they, what? <laughs> they don't get it. So. You have your youth in heaven. The colors there are amazing. Now we have three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, or depending on the color scheme, it can be red, blue, and green. And a mixture of those three colors make up every color of the rainbow that we see. There are over 80, eight zero primary colors in heaven. So if you looking at this first realm and you're seeing the colors, it's just mind blowing. And they come back and they, you know, I say, well, what colors did you see? And they said, well, we don't have them here. You know, try describing 
what colors look like to some you can only see in black and white you can't so heaven is a big buffet for the senses it's a it's a wonderful place now um the different levels of heaven i've only heard the higher levels described a few times so in the higher levels you tend to be just sort of a being of of light and energy and each level is more mysterious and wonderful and amazing and glorious than the last and more are being continually created which was a shock to me i always thought you know god created the world you know universe in seven days that's what i was taught in catholic school and there it is you know it's set no creation is a, is a growing process i mean through all of nature everything we see here on earth plants grow children grow you know animals grow businesses and why would we think god is static you know we're a little microcosm of the macrocosm of god so of course there's there's growth of god now some people asked about religion and some ask what's the right religion expecting to hear something like catholicism or buddhism or judaism and a lot of religious people don't like this answer but when they ask about religion the answer is always the same the best religion is the one that brings you closest to god the one that makes you a, a loving person so how do they view religion in heaven this is kind of interesting it, it took me a while to get this because i was raised Christian and Catholic, when I found out a lot of the things they told me weren't true, I was very upset. You know, original sin. I, I'm born dirty? Wait a minute, you mean that's not true? I'm born as a as a beautiful child of God and he sees me as perfect? Yeah, so I was pretty, pretty angry at religion, but religion is a tool. So back in the 1700s, when they had long voyages that lasted several years, they would, the crews would die of scurvy sometimes half or two-thirds of the crew would die of scurvy because they, they wouldn't get vitamin C. It's a disease from a, a long-term lack of vitamin C in your diet. So they ate salt beef and thing, and you know rice and things like that, but they, they didn't get fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, Captain Cook had a brew that he served to his crew, and it contained salt and vinegar and pepper, and it was just this horrible Adams family combination of, of junk. But one of the things in that in that syrup, in that uh, in that brew was lemon syrup which is loaded with vitamin c so if you drank captain cook's brew you didn't get scurvy uh, but the reason is because there was only one active ingredient so the active ingredient in any religion is the universal creator's love and so many of the world's religions have so much in common brotherly love charity forgiveness peace harmony yes there are some factions that are somewhat corrupted by men but for the most part they are good tools and if a person is in any religion in any religion and focused on love that they're going they're going to be growing their souls so the best religion is the one that, that brings you closest to god and uh cryon he's a uh, trans channeler channeled by lee carroll he has some pretty good analogies that fit well with what near-death experiences say and i wanted to share those he said that god can be seen as a giant loving tree with roots that spread out to all of humanity and from the trunk of this giant tree there are many branches there are branches of catholicism judaism hinduism buddhism muslim all sorts of branches and you can branch out any way you want and still be connected to the trunk god is not and heaven they are not invested in the dynamics of re religious structure as we are the creative benevolent source that we call God, it, it does not have the mind of a man. It is pure light and love and consciousness and goodness. It doesn't have anger. It doesn't have judgment. It doesn't even have expectation the way we do. It has hopes. It hopes that we enjoy our experiences down here and grow and learn. It basically only loves. And so the way sort of God would view somebody joining religion to get to know him would be the way we would, for instance, imagine if you were separated uh, from a spouse and you had a bitter divorce and the spouse gets custody of the children and out of spite takes them far away from you and hides them, doesn't want you to see them. And you're in despair and you look for your children for many, many years. 
and you finally give up. And one day they call and they say, it's us. We've been looking for you for years. We're in your neighborhood. We want to come and see you. And you're just overjoyed, right? So you go outside, you know, you wait. And there's a car coming down the street. It's them. Oh, my God, my kids are here. Now, let me ask you this. Does anybody really care what kind of car it is? Do you care if it's a brand new car in perfect working condition or a beat up old junky car with a lot of props? You don't care. You're just happy your kids are coming to see and connect with you. So God doesn't care if we're in this, you know, religion with a lot of questionable doctrines or things that might be a little off. He's just happy that we're coming to see him. So that's kind of how God views religion. And I personally view religion as different cultures in their own unique ways, honoring God the way they want. You know, just like a parent, every, every child sort of shows love in a different way. You know, one child draws a little drawing. You know, here, I love you, mommy. Another helps out with the chores. And another just runs up and hugs you and says, I love you. I think there's a beauty in your children expressing love in different ways. And I think God sees that too, the way we, that we express love through many different religions and, and just many personal spiritual beliefs. So, okay, what are the after effects of the NDE? Well, we talked about some of them. People come back changed. It can be very difficult because after you've experienced pure perfection, pure joy, pure happiness, coming back here can be real difficult. A lot of people complain about gravity. Uh, you're weightless on the other side, and people complain about the heavy feeling of gravity. Uh, some enter into severe depression because they want to go back to that loving, amazing place. Some have problems with family because they come back loving all of humanity. And families used to being number one, and you get people coming back having this altruistic love for everybody, and it can cause some envy to people who are close to those who had the NDE. Some people go through a, a career change, as we talked earlier. Some go through a marital change. So a marriage will often not survive an NDE. And if it does, it continues in a completely different way than it did before because that person is now a different person. And so they come back profoundly changed. They tend to change everything about the way they handle life. The biggest thing being they tend to take risks. They tend to roll the dice. They tend to not cower in fear about doing something. Their psychic gives some abilities. Some of them come back and they make very good livings as uh, a spiritual counselor, a psychic healer, you know, working with Reiki. Some see spiritual angels, some talk with the dead, and they come back with these gifts that help to uh, serve humanity. And Tina, you know this very well. Yes. I mean, when we first talked, you know, Tina tells me, well, this is what I see in you. And she nailed it. I mean, she didn't know anything about me. And she just knew some issues that not even my own family members know. So it's an amazingly transformative experience when these people come back. It, it always changes their life. Now, there are some people who try and commit suicide to, to go back there, only to be told, you know, you are not to decide when you die. Um, I've heard so many people have conversations with God or angels or people, and it's always loving conversations, gentle, loving. The only time I ever hear about a sternness from that light is when people commit suicide. We're, this is not something we're not supposed to do. So they get sent back if they try and commit suicide. You know, you're not supposed to take your life through suicide. And uh, life down here is supposed to be difficult. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later. We'll talk about what's going on with Earth. Um, but let's talk for a moment about if heaven is so great, what is the purpose of having a physical life on Earth? Okay, so if it's this amazing place, why are you putting this us in this in this horrible place? Well, that's a tough one. I've never gotten a super clear. This is the answer. I've asked a lot of people. But I'll try and give an overview as best I can. And maybe in the question and answer session, if some of you can chime in with some of your ideas, because I'm I've always liked to hear new perspectives on this. So the way I understand it is that physical incarnations are the engine of growth of God. So that example of Disneyland, you can know everything about Disneyland. And until you've experienced it, you really don't know it. Okay, so on the other side of the veil, 
when you're connected to perfect love, perfect peace, perfect joy, you're in a situation where you can't really put yourself to the test, put your money where your mouth is. What if you're put in a situation where you forget that you're a piece of God, you forget that you're immortal, you are somewhat disconnected, you have the illusion of a separateness from that beauty of an afterlife, and now you're down here in a difficult situation. All right, well, it's easy to be nice to people when I'm in a good mood. When I'm in a bad mood, that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Uh, it's easy to lift a five pound weight, you know, do curls. Well, what about a 40 pound weight? So it's almost like an experience. We're not really learning anything new. We're having experiential learning down here. So we have this fear, love, duality. And the way I understand it is that push, pull, fear, love. We dip into fear, go back into love. That's almost like when a car gets stuck in the mud and you're rocking the car out, you go back a little bit and then you can push it forward further. So the further you dip into fear, the further you can spring out into the light. And near-death experiences have talked about experience the opposite of what you want helps you experience more of what you want. Now, an example I have in my book that I came up with was one called The King's Son. So this will give you an example of, of the importance of life on Earth. There was once a kingdom, a benevolent king who was good to his people and took care of them and really cared about them. And firstborn son was going to be king someday, but the son grew up in the royal palace. So he had servants to cater to his every whim and, and wish and obey his every order. And he had royal meals every day since he was born. He never suffered. He never had to struggle like many of the people in the kingdom. And he grew up very spoiled with very little concern for the people of the kingdom. And the, his father, the king, realized, my son is not fit to be king. He is not fit. And so when his second son was born, he took that son to a family of poor farmers. And he said, you are to raise this young prince, never telling him that he is a prince, never telling him that he will be king. And we will come back on his 18th birthday. So that young prince grew up on a farm. He had long hours of hard backbreaking labor. You know, he got in arguments with his brothers and sisters. They struggled sometimes for food. You know, he was afraid sometimes they wouldn't have enough food for the winter. And he suffered, but he also learned to cooperate with his adop adopted family. And he learned all about farming. And, and when the situation was particularly bleak, the king would send his men in the night and leave food on the doorstep. And when that young man turned 18, the king came and said, you are, are going to be king. Uh, you are actually my son and you're going to be king. And that young prince became a benevolent king. He had compassion and feelings for the people of his kingdom and for the poor because he was one. He experienced what, what it was like to be there. And he also found out, even though he feared that whole time, you know, sometimes he feared, you know, where are we going to eat? His father was watching over him. He was never in any danger. So that's how it is down here. It's scary being down here, but we're never really in any danger. Um, even dying is, is just as easy as waking up from a dream. Uh, we're a moral being, so we anything that happens down here is just temporary suffering. So there's never real any uh, any real danger down here. So the 1987 movie Overboard expresses the same concept in that way. So by coming down here and incarnating into physical realities, we do this push pull with love and fear, and we propel ourselves upward to higher higher levels of consciousness. Now. Earth, and this was quite a shock to me, one of the biggest shocks was many people when they're up there, they, they ask questions. Some people ask several thousand questions, right? Because there's no time in heaven, right? So you can be dead one, one minute. And one guy said he was only dead for about 30 seconds. And he said, my question and answer period was longer than my college degree, my eight year doctorate, right? So they asked several thousand questions. And a common question is, is there life on other planets are we alone in the universe and they kind of chuckle and they say well now the universe is full of life and there are other dimensions countless other dimensions that all contain their own universes that are also full of life well let's talk a moment about 
our galaxy. Now, our galaxy is about 100,000 light years side to side. So if you were to travel at the speed of light, that's seven times around the Earth in one second. And you were, one, you were to go from one side of our galaxy to the other, keeping in mind our galaxy is a tiny little pinpoint in the universe, it's just a little dot, you would have to travel 24 hours a day, seven days a week, an entire lifetime. And then you'd have to do that for 1,200 lifetimes. That's just across the pinpoint of, of space that our galaxy occupies. And there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. So this is a universe full of life. Now we're talking only about our universe, which is a pinpoint of light in the super universe. I have heard quite a few times, Earth is the most difficult planet in this galaxy, hundreds of billions of stars, millions of civilized species, the most difficult planet to incarnate in, in this galaxy. And it's one of the most difficult in the entire universe. So, you know, when people say, oh, why am I having such a hard time in life? Or, you know, it's just so difficult down here. And but it's like, well, that's because you're like the best of the best taking on the granddaddy of all challenges. You know, you, you took on the Mount Everest of incarnations, you know, new souls, they don't incarnate on her. I mean, souls that don't have experience incarnating the physical life, they don't incarnate here. It's way too hostile. You don't send a child to just learn how to walk up a trick on up Mount Everest. You just don't do that. It's, it's too difficult. So the people here are experienced souls, old souls. And the group of people, the kind of people that would come to a meeting like this or listen to a talk like this, those are the experts within that group of experts. So many of the people who had near-death experiences, you're like the best of the best of the Green Berets of the Navy SEALs. I mean, cut yourself slack. <laughs> this is a difficult place to be. That's why we have such a hard time. But it's also one of the places where the growth is amazing. You, through experiential learning, you learn a whole lot in a really short time. It is just like a major boost in consciousness. Now, we're all immortal, so we can do things at our own pace, right? So if I have to get from here to a mile away on foot, I can take a leisurely walk, but it's going to take me a while. Or I can sprint, and it's going to be real uncomfortable, and I'm going to suffer, but I'm going to get there fast, right? We weren't put here on, put here on Earth to suffer. Just like you don't climb Mount Everest to suffer, but suffering is going to be part of the experience down here. So I like to say, you know, cut yourself and other people lots of slack. There's people acting out in darkness, you know, remember I was there once. You don't learn to act in love and light until you pass through many moments of darkness. Even if somebody's in a religion that kind of rubs you the wrong way, um, you know, it's important to, to remember that we're all walking towards the same goal. You know, I, I once walked on that path that they did. I once needed that tool. So I try and remember that when I get frustrated with other people. And one of the most meaning things to those in heaven is when we're purposefully loving and kind and compassionate, especially the people who are, who our ego tells us, you know, they don't deserve it. Somebody's betrayed me, you know, and they deserve punishment when somebody manages to humble themselves and say, you know what, I'm going to let that go. You know, they're working out their issues. That's really meaningful to, to those in heaven. Um, so let's talk about what's occurring on earth right now. Well, the dance of consciousness is always one of two steps forward and one step back. No planet in the entire galaxy, according to some who have had near-death experiences who asked about this, no planet in the history of this galaxy, not the universe, this galaxy, has ever sunk so far into darkness and then sprung back into the light. So every planet with intelligent life takes one of two courses. They either destroy themselves through a combination of, of war and environmental disaster, or they learn to live with each other and with nature in harmony and they become an ascended species and they eventually seed life on another planet. We were seeded by uh, a group of beings called the Pleiadians and they were seeded by the Arcturians. And so thank God, Earth is on the path of going to be an ascended planet. So we came close to destroy, destroying ourselves, 
real close back in the 80s. Uh, USSR and the United States had weapons pointed at each other. We had the consciousness to do it. We had the attitude to do it. And thanks to a lot of uh, help and intervention from above, it was avoided. The juggernaut is already on its way. So we are past the point of no return. There's not going to be an Armageddon. There's not going to be a sudden mass extinction of human beings. We are on our way to becoming a scented planet. But we're just in the beginning stages. We're like in the terrible twos where we're just starting out. And a lot of people are acting out. A lot of people are misbehaving. There's still probably a good third of the world that's in survival mode. You know, you growl and snarl and bite anybody who gets in your way or threatens your survival. Well, that's an old paradigm that's going away. So humanity right now is moving from a paradigm of competition and survival to one of cooperation and unity. So one of the messages I hear over and over again from near-death experiences is that we're all connected. We're more connected than separate. It's only an illusion of separateness. You know, if I get revenge on somebody, I'm harming myself. All right. So, you know, if you're a near-death experience researcher, if you had an NDE, you know that revenge is impossible. Because you have a life review up there and you experience as if you were that person, what they felt according to what you did. So revenge is impossible. I, I saw a billboard when I was out riding my bike one day and it said, none of us are well until all of us are well. Well, that's, that's very true. So, I mean, if humanity, if every person tomorrow had a near-death experience that lasted three seconds, okay, and they saw this connectedness, the next day, all the low-hanging fruit would get picked. It would be gone. All the low-hanging fruit in the entire planet would be gone in an instant. The homeless people, people who are mentally ill, too old, too sick, or unwilling to care for themselves and have been forgotten by society and are suffering hugely. It doesn't take much resources to help those people. You know, if we took 10% of the military budget in the U.S. and we divided it up among the homeless, that's $15,000 a homeless person per year. Those, that group of people, the forgotten group, they would be swarmed because it's easy with just a little bit of love and compassion to transform a life into somebody who's happy and joyful and productive and working towards our common goal. You know, a businessman who's, you know, got lots of money and wealth and he sees his value in being in control of others, that's a hard case. That's that's a hard one to work with. But yeah, there's lots of low-hanging fruit out there. So we are in the process of maturing as a species. And there's a great battle right now between what I would call the dark hats and the light hats. People ask, is there a, you know, a cabal or a Illuminati or something like this? I don't know. I've never heard a direct answer. I do know that there is a group of very powerful, wealth, wealthy people who are pulling most of the strings in our world, and they want a command and control world, and the world's not going to go that way. So everything they do is accelerating the process to peace on earth, which is the first step, and then we're going to really start cooperating, and, and they'll eventually be affected too. They'll be dragged along to this unity, and when they finally give up, they're going to say, oh, okay true happiness wasn't one of, about having incredible wealth and be able to control my environment. True happiness is about being a contributing member to the community at the same time. Um, so every, everyone's going to benefit from it, but we're in this tug of war right now, and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, we're in a one-step back phase of, of that dance of two steps forward and one step back. And there are lots of conspiracies out there, and the and the word from the other side of the veil is most of them are true. But you know what? They don't want us to focus on that. I mean, does it really help the goal of world peace to, to run around talking about all the secret dark stuff these, that's going on beneath the surface? No, it doesn't. I mean, the best thing we can probably do is just focus on our own world, uh, the people around us. You know, I don't watch the news. I don't like the news. The news is nothing more than a well-crafted fear report. It's it's mostly negative, and it's going to be a lot of misinformation. Uh, so I tell people, you know, if you want to have a good life, just pay attention to your world. And and for most people, some people have a pretty difficult situation. But for most people, there's no war in their worlds, their own personal worlds. There's no murder. I mean, I've never seen a murder. I've never seen a stabbing. I've never seen a robbery. In my in my world, if there were no worldwide communication, 
I would think I lived in a pretty amazing world. And when you focus on the good, so because we are little facets of God, separating and incarnating and pretending to be human, we are creator gods, we're little pieces of that big creator. We, what we focus on tends to happen. We tend to make it happen. So near-death experiences often talk about, be careful about your words and your thoughts. Words and thoughts have power. And I don't know what healed me. I don't know why I was in a mobility scooter for three years, but now I can walk six miles. But I do know I spent a lot more time around nature and I do know I changed my attitude. I started saying out loud so my ears would hear it, every day I'm getting stronger, every day my body's getting better. And it only took about six months or a year in this new environment, just being positive, being around nature for me to heal. So I really do believe that words and thoughts have great power. So if you, if you stay away from all the negativity and craziness and focus on the beauty that's just shining from the souls of so many people who have had near-death experiences and those who just study them. I mean, these are, I, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world to have a, a hobby investigating near-death experiences because I just, I get this outpouring of higher consciousness and people talking about wonderful concepts, um, you know, how to, how to change, how to improve ourselves, how to forgive, how to grow, how to get along especially with those who are real tough to get along with. It's, it's a wonderful group to focus on. And that's what's coming out of the hearts of these people. And uh, focusing on that, it's, it's what's going to bring us into a new world of love. The new world of love is coming. And according to New Death Experiencers, there's no set timeline. We can go as fast or slow as we want. You know, Do I want to run or walk over there, right? But somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 years, this planet's going to be different. Uh, one guy said, you know, you think about the world 150 years ago, you know, no cars, no cell phones, it was completely different, right? He said, it's, if an alien came here and saw this world today, and he looked at it and says, oh, this is the kind of place I'm going to lock my spaceship doors when I go through here. I'm not talking to these people. They're barbaric. Um, and he came back 150 years later. The reaction would be, oh, my God, what happened here? these people really got their act together. Wow, they really, holy cow. So the, the rest of our galaxy, believe it or not, they have watched in disbelief. So the, many of the intelligent beings on our planets have watched in disbelief, just jaw dropping like those humans dipped that far into darkness and didn't destroy themselves. And now they're coming back out on top and they're gonna make it. I mean, we shocked the galaxy. And the entire galaxy benefits from what we learn, our spiritual learning here. So by what we do here, uh, the tiniest little act of love or kindness, right? You, you bring hope to one soul and it elevates all of humanity. The entire galaxy is benefiting from that. You know, so I, I almost laugh when I hear somebody say, well, I'm not very successful. You know, I'm just a clerk or I'm just a waitress or I'm just a plumber. Like, are you kidding? A generator of light and love on this planet in this duality, you know, helping grow the fractal of God and, and, and setting an example that the entire galaxy learns from you. You're like those crazy daredevils who, you know, put on the flying suits and we go, wow, those guys, they're amazing. That's how the rest of the galaxy views us. The human beings. So, you know, if human beings were really aware of who they are, our problem would not be self-doubt. It would be it would be arrogance, right? You know, like we're these amazing beings. So that's the situation, um, and that's about it. So, do we want to open it up for questions? And I'm happy to talk about any. Specifics. David, um, how about talking a bit about your book and what made you write it? Okay, yeah, my book and what made me write. So my book is called God Took My Clothes. And at the time I wrote my book, I had only heard around 700 near-death experiences. I stopped counting after I wrote my book, but I'm estimating I've probably heard around 1,200. So I've learned some things, things since then. I wrote my book because there was a, a lot of individual testimonies. There was a lot of people that had very great books that are far beyond my knowledge level that were very esoteric in their spiritual knowledge. But I didn't see anything, any books out there that really kind of put it all together and summarized it well. 
And I thought this needs to be done whether I ever make a dime on it or not. And I still have never made a dime. I think I'm like still $4,000 negative because it just got published last year. But it's selling some. Um, and it, it's just kind of a summary of a lot of things I just talk about. I go into a lot more detail. I have a lot of quotes of people talking about what the light felt like and things like that. And I have a whole section on competition versus cooperation and, you know, um, the the environments of heaven and the, the hellish NDEs and why those happen and, you know, religion and, and war. And I go into some details, but I wanted to get the information out there. Um, and for anybody who's interested, you can read the first two chapters for free. If you go to godtookmyclothes.com, um, there's a download of preview of the book. And apparently if you write a book in a second language, it's not considered the same book. So the publisher owns the rights to my book. I can't give it away for free, but I can give the unpublished copy away. So, you know, if you want the book and you, you don't care about not having a paperback or not having an ebook for your Nook or Kindle, uh, you can send me an email. My contact information is there and just say, send me the PDF and I'll send you the unpublished uh, version, which you can read on your computer or laptop. It's probably too small for a phone unless you've got really good eyes, but uh, you can get the complete book. You know, we're here for each other's understanding, encouragement, and love. And it's not all about trying to make a buck and give me money before I, I share the information that so many freely shared with me. So I encourage people out there to, to, you know, find something you like, whether it's near-death experiences or spirituality, and, and dive into it because the information can transform lives. Thank you, David. Anyone, anyone else? Questions? No questions? Comments? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Go ahead. A question. Sure. Bethany. Uh, um, oh, Bethany, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Willie. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so about these folks out there in the other galaxy, when do we uh -huh. get to meet them? Well, um, we're at the point where we're not ready for that. If they were to show up, I mean, does anybody, this is a, an older crowd, around my my age and older so remember the original movie to the day the earth stood still remember that oh, yeah yeah well i mean what do you think would happen if they showed up on the white house lawn you know they'd be surrounded by tanks and you know they if we're in that consciousness they were not ready to meet them and it could cause widespread economic chaos the guesstimate is before 2050 there's talk it may happen a lot sooner uh, it's probably going to be the Pleiadians who are galactic parents. They're watching over us. Uh, they, they could, for instance, the Pleiadians have very high technology and they could fix our planet's problems. They could clean up the planet in one month with their technology, less than one month. But they're not going to do it for the same reason you don't clean up your child's room for you, for them. <laughs> you know, they, they got to learn to clean it up. Mm -hmm. So they'll make an appearance. They'll let us know who they are when we're ready. Um, that's going to be quite a shocker uh, to, to learn about history. They have millions of years of recorded history. Now, when I first started hearing from near-death experiencers and, and so forth about the Pleiadians, I, I was kind of laughing. It was really early in my research, and I thought, well, these guys are phony because they're talking about a galactic federation of planets transporters, replicators, a prime directive. And I'm like, you guys are copying Star Trek. You're not even being creative about your bad lie. Mm. <laughs> well, being an engineer, you know, I don't, I don't just believe stuff, right? I got to look into it. So I investigate. Back in the 50s, Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, he was part of a group of Pleiadian trans channelers. And I got, I downloaded copies of the actual minutes from those meetings in the 50s where these Pleiadians talked about all this stuff. He got his ideas from a real Galactic Federation of Planets. So I'm just laughing, you know, the Pleiadians show up and they start talking about this. They're going to be like, they're copying Amazing. Star Trek. What are they talking about? No, Star Trek is a copy of the Pleiadians. So. Hmm. All right. Does that answer the question? So Jack, uh, Jack is next and then Susan. Go ahead, Jack. Okay. Uh, hi, Dave. Uh, hi. Thank you. That's a really great 
vision of, of the, the, the NDE and, and afterlife. Um, you said you uh, have, um, heard about 700 NDEs and um, in their description of, the, of them, of their selves in the other realm, what uh, they're, they're like two two categories. One <clears throat> where they they describe themselves as uh, kind of human beings, but transparent. But they're they're you know what they look like on the, on this side. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> and the other group, uh, they describe themselves as being beings of light or orbs of energy. And I wondered if you just talk about those two and which um uh, you know what which ones are in the majority and etc the majority I, I had heard 700 the time i wrote my book the majority of the ones i've heard were sort of a sphere of energy and i think that's the natural form and but you can take on any form you want so in the lower realms of heaven in that room I described where they have streets and cathedrals and all that, um, you can take on a body. And I even heard one near-death experience where this angel was showing this young girl. She said, watch, and she disappeared and came back as, as somebody else. So you can transform your appearance any way you want. So the ones that have bodies generally say they're semi-transparent. They can like see through their fingers and they're made of light. And others are balls of energy. Probably the more experienced souls are going directly maybe subconsciously, just sort of like out of habit, are going directly towards that sphere of energy. This is just a, a theory, by the way. I haven't heard this from a near-death experience. And others, they have this residual memory. Some are even show up in the afterlife wearing the same clothing they had. Well, that's because that's what they expect. And remember, thoughts are manifested. So if you expect to be a body with the same clothing you had on when you died, because you don't even know you died, you end up in the afterlife initially with a body with the same clothing you had when you died. So, um, and then there are some realms where they kind of, if they have a body, they'll kind of wear the same thing. So like the white tunic, you know, with the sash, you know, that just didn't come from nowhere. Human beings just didn't think out of, the, of nowhere. That's what they wear in heaven. No, in one of the realms, that's what they really wear. <laughs> it's very, very comfortable. Okay. Well, uh... Uh, thank you. I, I, you know, I've never forgotten that <clears throat> uh, Einstein has said, if humankind does not destroy itself, eventually we will become orbs of energy and we won't have a body. So anyway, thank you. Yes, I have heard some near-death experiences were shown other planets with intelligent life and some were told that at a certain point, you do shed the physical and you can you can uh, travel from one place to another in the galaxy by thought without the use of ships. So I haven't heard too much about that. That's only a handful of NDEs that talked about that stuff. Okay, but anyway, thank you. I appreciate your- Okay, Good question. Susan, did you wanna ask the question or do you want me to ask it for you? Could you ask it, Tina? Okay, so a question from, uh, let's see. What is the reason for life? <laughs> That's Susan from the Boston Ions. What is the reason for life? I yeah. well, Are we talking about physical life or life in general? Susan? Uh, well, um, phys physical. There, is, there physical. are seven of us here listening, and one is asking the question, and it's physical life that he's asking about. Thank you. Physical life. Okay, so physical life is a crash course in consciousness. So it goes back to kind of what we discussed, you know, the king's son, you know, experiencing. When you experience what you don't have, it causes you to desire and create more what you do. So I went once two days without eating and I had a piece of wheat toast. That was the first thing I ate. Well, I hated wheat bread. That was the most delicious piece of bread. Okay, I appreciate it a lot more. And because we are creator gods, when you have an appreciation, you grow it. 
you grow whatever you're appreciating. So when you are separate and go into fear mode, and then you find your way back into the connection of love, the connection of our creator and source, that helps you, that strengthens you. It's a strengthening of the spiritual muscle, like lifting weights. And again, this is what I was going to, you know, ask the input from the group because I've gotten lots of hints about the purpose of life here. I know it's very important. I know we're kind of like the, I don't want to say the word enjoy, but God experiences everything that every part of creation experiences throughout all of time. So if an ant gets stepped on, the, the consciousness of God ex experiences that. Um, this is a particularly physical lives that we learn is particularly fun. Okay. So think about it. You're going to do training and you've got a virtual reality machine. This is years in the future. And it's so good. That's completely indistinguishable from real life. So what is the ultimate in virtual reality? If you're in a dangerous situation like war or you're mountain climbing, that might be a lot of fun and amazing as a virtual simulation, but the ultimate is to not know you're in a virtual reality. It's to forget that you're good and fine and that you're, nothing's going to happen to you. You can't be harmed. Uh, you know, you're, you're an immortal being that can, can never be destroyed. You can never cease to exist. That's not an attribute of God. You forget that? Well, that's the ultimate virtual reality right there. That's the ultimate training. And that's the best I have. I wish I had more. And if anybody's got a, a good perspective of that, please chime chime in. I'd love to hear different perspectives on that from the people who Thank you, David. There. Matt Riley has raised his hand. Matt? Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, Jim, thank you very much uh, for being here and sharing all this with us. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. Um, so I have a question here and just given everything that's going on in our world right now, I kind of feel compelled to ask this question. Um, <clears throat> if we're all connected in love and truly beings of light and we're all created by a benevolent and loving God, as you, you know, shared and, and, and kind of come across in, in your research, then I'm struggling with how can we possibly have the capacity for evil? And, and my follow-up is, you know, wouldn't it make logical sense that God also has this capacity that it exists within God and was created by God and then therefore instilled in us since we're a part of God and created from God that it's, it already existed with God and passed on, for lack of a better term, to us. And, that, okay, and that's, so, what, that's, well, that's what I'm really struggling with, given, again, current state of affairs in our world and, 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 and the horrors that we see occurring in places and, and the, the evil that we do to one another just is really, really, you know, something that I struggle with. Yeah, and I struggle with it too. When I look around and see the way people treat each other, it uh, it grieves me. I mean, even sometimes when I go on my walks, uh, you know, my wife and I once in a while will will do a neighborhood cleanup. We'll hook up a little trailer to it, and it just it pains me to see people trashing the environment. Evil and good. So evil and good are more human concepts. There really, as far as I understand it that doesn't exist so the reality is this unity consciousness where there's nothing but love beyond description now the word love is completely inadequate to describe it you, again only those who've experienced it know what i'm talking about i don't even know what i'm talking about when i reference that love those who have had ndes do so that's the reality but we can pretend or to be disconnected from that and the purpose of that is for the growth of that connection. So the connection becomes stronger. So, you know, a, a father leaves and goes off to Iraq for a, a three year tour. When he comes back, people are jumping all over him. They haven't seen him in a while. Okay, so when you're disconnected, it strengthens those bonds. It's enjoyable at the same time. Um, evil is just, 
again, back to that, that uh, Mount Everest uh, analogy. We're not down here to suffer. We're not here to treat each other poorly, but it's going to be part of the experience. When you're disconnected from unity consciousness, you're going to act out in survival mode. And there's going to be some people who act really horribly. But even they learn from the experience. Even they grow from the experience. So it's a growth experience. It's an experiential learning that causes growth of consciousness and a raising of vibration. Um, let's see. If I really wanted to give an example, I would say I have a friend um, who lives not too far away from me. And he is just a golden father. He is is strict with his children, but in a very loving way. He always talks to them with gentle, loving words, even when he's disciplining, even when he's, uh, you know, has to tell them, you know, you can't keep doing this or whatever. He is the most gentle, caring, loving father. He just wants his kids to be safe and happy and loved. And I said, Rick, why is this? How are you? you know, how'd you get to be such a good dad? And he says, oh, my, my dad beat me, you know. If I used the wrong towel in the bathroom, I'd get a beating. He was treated horribly by this alcoholic father. And because he experienced that, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm never doing that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the opposite. And so it's this, this push-pull. Is God evil? Well, there's no such thing. But it, he can pretend to forget the unity. He can split off a little piece of himself that becomes human and have the illusion of separateness. And then we get this thing that we call evil, which really isn't that horrible when you think about it. I mean, somebody asked about the Holocaust. He was talking with Jesus in his near-death experience. He says, well, how can you let this happen? And God said, well, you know, that's the thing you humans do. You invent a cure for cancer, a specific kind of cancer, and you pat yourselves on the back. And then when something bad happens, you, you blame God. And then the opposite is true. <laughs> you know, normally like if there's an inspiration for a new technology that's going to help people that came from God and, and the bad stuff we, we created. So one guy asked about the Holocaust. Well, how can God let that happen? So Jesus brings him back to the Holocaust. And he's there, just like it was the 1940s. And the Germans are yelling at these Jews coming off the train and they're separating them. And the dogs are barking and it's snowing. And they're putting people in ovens and burning them. And he looks at Jesus and says, okay, so? how were you here in this situation and he said look up and the guy looked up above the ovens and he saw thousands of beautiful angelic beings of light and love just radiating this beauty welcoming the hundreds of people who were just burned to death and their souls were taken from their bodies before they burned so they didn't even have the memory of a horrific death and he said they're fine they're overjoyed to be out of that nightmare they're fine and they can come back whenever they want you know if i'm playing a video game and i i shoot the other player you know interactive video game oh he's dead well no his character's dead <laughs> you know um evil isn't really evil and i know that answer doesn't make much sense but that's the best explanation i have Okay, thank you. So, David, uh, what was brought to mind uh, to, for me um, was the fact that the Earth experience, we have duality in it, which has, it's a balancing act between evil and, and goodness or, or dark and light. It's part of the experience, and we already knew when before we came on the earth that this was going to be part of it. Oh yes, uh, long before we show up here, we know what you know. We know it's going to be tough, and you know, uh, Lee Carroll, he he uh, French channels cry on, and he gives this talk, and he says, "I'll I'll tell you the conversation I have with you guys." He was just a, a spiritual entity which helps human beings. He's never been human himself. He's never incarnated. And he says, well, wait a minute. You're, you're going back down there? Yeah. To that hostile place, you're going to forget 
about the love and the connection. You're not going to hear the music anymore. You're not going to feel the joy. You're going to suffer. You're going to be in these frail bodies and experience fear and pain and suffering. You're going back there? Yes, I am. Now, not to give away too much, well, which earth? Same one I came from. I'm going to I'm going to see this through. Well, I'm going to keep going back and we're going to keep going back till this is an ascended planet. I mean, they look at us. Many near-death experiences have said to those, you know, to them on the other side of the veil, we're the courageous ones. You know, we do it because we're spiritual daredevils. We get a kick out of it. We enjoy it. We like the challenge. And uh, it, it transforms. We're, we're helping grow creation by what we do here. I, I can't think of a more noble reason to to endure the suffering. You know, you talk to somebody who's climbed Mount Everest, you get to the top and it's a view you'll never forget for the rest of your life. But boy, do you suffer getting there. Yeah. You know, I suffer just uh, going on my walk sometimes and I'm not doing right. Coming back I'm like, oh my God, I don't feel like I can make it. But it's good for you. It's part of the, part of the challenge. Jack? Uh, David, um, yes. you know, we all talk about being connected mm -hmm. uh, the end of years and we even talk about it being that we're connected on this plane etc is there some explanation how that works in sort of human terms probably not but i've i have heard it described so when the soul incarnates into the the fetus and it normally does it somewhere between six and 12 weeks, somewhere in there. Uh, the Pleiadians actually have technology to, to determine when the soul has entered. That's pretty crazy. So um, how do I explain this? Well, you know, um, uh, the NDEers to, uh, describe how they communicate telepathically. Now, oh, okay, okay. Hey, well, now, you know, uh, somehow we we sort of understand that. I mean, we understand what te tele uh, communi communication, but uh, tele telepathic communication. So that that's a that's an element of it. But there's more to it. We're talking about being connected, not just with each other but being part of the cosmos. Part of the cosmos. Okay, so getting back to my example there, I would say the brain, okay, I thought of something good here. The brain is like a blindfold. Okay, so if you, if a child, you put a blindfold on the child, they can get scared because they can't see anymore. So the brain is sort of what creates fear. Um, and it also creates the block. So when one lowers their vibration, you are unaware of higher vibrations. So higher vibrations see us, but we can't see them. Okay, so another analogy would be tuning into a radio station. Okay, so you can have a radio, and until you know to tune it into the right station, you're not gonna hear. So when you're in a low vibrational state, you can't hear higher vibrations. When you're a higher vibrational state, you can communicate with everything beneath you and at your level. Uh, I have heard that these vibrational states have something to do with multidimensional quantum energy. I've also heard talk that in the afterlife, they set up what they call quantum fields. And within these fields, anything can be created, any environment can be created without limitation to size. So the communication, psychic communication and connectedness, what that is, is it's people sort of seeing through the blindfold a little bit. You know, it's, it's like an opaqueness there. And when a person has an NDE, that veil, that lower vibrational state that prevents us from feeling and experiencing and being aware of the connectedness or the communication, the mind-to-mind -mind communication, 
that veil lightens, it becomes more clear. And that's why so many of them are able to use their gifts. So every human being on earth has psychic abilities it's, and they all use them every day subconsciously. It's just a matter of, of how they do that. And you know, I'll give an example. Mine, um, I was in a worsening condition physically and I was out in California and uh, I kept getting stronger and stronger the message, you need to move into a, a little trailer and get out in nature. And I bought, I'm only away for a couple of days here. I'm out of house in Texas. I came back in my trailer, lived in this trailer here for two years. And it's called a micro mini, two words and they both mean small. <laughs> and it wasn't easy, but it healed me. And the reason is I heard through that psychic veil. So the pineal gland is the gland that connects us to that multidimensional quantum energy. And so which gland? Uh, the pineal gland. I think I'm saying that right. Yeah. Chime in, anybody? If uh... I call it the pineal gland, but pineal it's gland. Pineal <laughs> gland. Thank you. The pineal gland. All right. So yeah, it's the pineal gland, and it can become calcified, you know. And there's things to do, but it's it's just like any other muscle. Okay. So if you use your legs a lot, your legs are going to get stronger. When people start listening to that inner voice. And I often miss it. I went to the store the other day with my, my wife and we were getting groceries for the trip. And I saw the milk and I, my thought was go get some milk. And I went, wait a minute, we don't need milk. She's gonna bring the milk from the fridge. She forgot milk. And I, I didn't listen to it. But the more you listen to that little inner voice, the stronger it gets. Just like the more you use the muscle, the stronger it gets. So- It's all about practice. Little, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a practice thing. And then some people just like muscles. Some people are naturally more muscular than others. Same with psychic abilities. Some people are just natural. Others got to work at it. But everybody has it. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I, uh, question. I have one more question. Sure. Okay. You talk about our vi having a vibration, a high and low. Uh, okay. and, and I know we're getting into quantum physics and all of that and I which I don't understand at all but what what is this vibration that you, we talk about well um, the information from near-death experiences is very spotty on this so we're talking two or three so the disclaimer is this is all theory when I hear something four or five hundred times like the light was loving that I can be sure of I can tell you for sure that's true. Quantum vibration. So something vibrates. And it's if we were to put it in, in terms of um, our reality, string theory talks about strings of energy with which vibrate at different frequencies. And that vibration creates different matter. So if you go online to YouTube and and say sound experiment patterns. They will show you that as they raise the frequency of sound, they put sand on a piece of flat metal and they vibrate that metal. And as the frequencies go higher and higher, it forms more and more complex patterns. So it's a vibration on the quantum level that creates more of what is. And as the vibration raises, the pattern becomes more and more elaborate. And this creation process has been going on for a very long time, as is evidenced by the countless numbers of universes that contain realities. And it's continuing to grow and more and more, more being created. And it's through this vibrational growing of a fractal. So the universe grows like a fractal. So all throughout nature, uh, nature is all fractals. They've discovered this quite some time ago when it, the way a tree grows, it's a trunk and grows and it splits in two and then that branch splits into two. So it's a repeating pattern that goes both infinitely large and infinitely small. And that pattern sort of loops in on itself and grows so that you have even smaller and even larger things where it loops. Now, I know that sounds confusing. It was confusing to me when I heard it, but that's the best explanation I have. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, David. Okay, before I go to uh, Kathy, yeah. let me just say the, uh, as far as the, the work that I do, uh, I feel that in order for me to connect to the entities that are ready to give me messages for clients, or friends, whatever, 
I have to vibrate at the same frequency. Okay. Now, Tina, have you That's how I explain it. They have to lower their frequency. Yes, I got I'm getting it's one. Yes, a, it's something to do with it. alignment. I understand right. it as as an alignment. Yes. So if you're down here, vibrating down here, and they're up here, you got to come somewhere. And in the then align. Right. Yeah. Okay, Kathy, and your that's turn. That's what trans channels do. They they raise their frequency and then the dance has to lower theirs. They don't like doing that, but they have to lower. Theirs. I can feel it. I can yeah. feel. David, I can feel that when the vibration matches the others, in order for me to be able to communicate. Okay. Mm. Okay. Kathy? Yes, first of all, David, thank you so much. Oh, I totally enjoyed um, your whole presentation, especially grateful to hear that in 150 years, um, it's going to look a whole lot different. So I feel much more relaxed for my grandchildren um, because I have been concerned that we are ready to self-destruct. Uh, but I've been approaching it in a positive way and just, you know, sending love. But I haven't gone to the fear place, but just concern. And just now talking about um, the vibration, about how, you know, the vibration of love is the highest vibration. I think it's something like 500 megahertz. I think that's what they do it. Like Christ vibrated at 1,000 megahertz. And then how the, there's a book called um, Power Versus Force. I don't know if anyone's ever read that, but it's wonderful. And it just talks about the different levels of vibration, like food, you know, like meat vibrates at a lower vibration than vegetables and how um, anger and, um, and greed and envy vibrate at a much lower vibration, like 30 megahertz versus love at 500. So it's, it is fascinating and just, um, you know, and, and, and I feel somebody was talking about asking about, you know, what is life about? I mean, I just feel like our purpose in being here is to be an extension of love and to learn how to do that. And so that's kind of, that's where I put my attention and uh, learning to live in the highest vibration that I can. So um, I just totally appreciate your whole presentation, David. So thank you so much. And you've inspired me to decide what it is that I enjoy so much that I want to put all of my attention on so that um, it can be as transforming as it was for you. So thank, thank you so you. much. For your time. I really appreciate that. You know, thank you. You're talking, I, was, I was reminded of uh, Nikola Tesla's Willie? words. I'm sorry, somebody speaking? Keep, Did I, was I talking over? Uh, Willie had his hand up, but he, you don't have the sound on, Willie. Okay. Okay. Um, this is really interesting. And all this just makes me think, how real is reality? Um, is there what we call re reality? Is there anything that's really real? Now, I don't want to get lost in that. Or get everybody else lost in that but you gotta wonder um if everything that's going on all around you is all at different levels then where is that one level where everybody can come together and say yeah this is reality okay so again this is getting into theory because i only got little hints of uh, bits and pieces but what happens is it's like a giant crystal plate that breaks so if you can imagine consciousness of god is a giant plate that breaks and then all those crystals separate and then they all come back together only they've all grown so now the plate is bigger so i would say the the unity consciousness of god and it's this you know growing reconnecting again separating out and growing and reconnecting so it's this process what is real? I mean, one could argue that either side is real. You know, what's real with what we're doing right now? 
I mean, if somebody's saved this video on their computer, when the computer's turned off, it's just all a bunch of ones and zeros mixed in with all the other stuff, right? Unity computer consciousness. But anytime you want, you can call out a specific set of patterns and we watch this, this podcast or this video. So what is real? Well, it's just the whatever our consciousnesses can conceive, we can create and make real. And that's what the consciousness of God does. And that's evidenced by all of us sitting here. We've, we've co-created this reality together. So people talked about Earth being created. It was planned. And God and a whole host of his helpers got together and they planned it out and built it. So the people that are here now, the people watching this video, the people part of this, this group right now are all part of this creation process. We helped make this place. We helped our father build this place. <laughs> yeah, so it's real. We built it. Yeah. It's real Thank to you. me. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, Laurie. The sound on. Okay. Hi, David. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation tonight. I enjoyed it. And I, I just always wonder when I hear someone tell your story, it sounds similar to mine. Um, my near-death experience to the black void occurred from mold exposure in my home. I took two years to heal, and I heal mostly by walking outside. In a way, I'm glad I didn't get to see the light. So I wonder if it was your environment that was making you ill all those years. But um, that's just a, a thing I have because of the way my near-death experience occurred. And I shared that in one of the videos on Jeff Mara, hoping to reach out to people to let them know that this can be deadly. Um, and you've touched on a, a great number of points. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm most interested in in the near-death experiences, well, one of the things I wanted to say was I didn't see the pinpoint of light. I didn't feel the light and the love. I wasn't there long enough. And in some ways, I'm thankful that I didn't because that's probably got to be pretty tough to experience and come back, as you, so many people have told you. But my interest in near-death experience where I don't have a good clarity and understanding is of time on the other side, that the past, present, future can all be occurring at the same time. And I've heard people explain it as they are existing. So I'm like Lori Ng, you know, that, that there's this, um, there's this, um, you know, I, I try to understand and, and maybe you could explain a little bit about what people have talked about, like with um, when they experience time on the other side. Yeah, that's a very good point. There is no time on the other side of the veil. And I have a trouble understanding this too, Laura. It's very difficult for me to understand. I'll, I'll give some of the explanations I've heard, some of the better ones. One guy said, it's the eternal unfolding of now. Another person said it's instantly being aware of eternity. You know, we have what's happening right now and what happened yesterday and what's going to happen tomorrow, but up there it's all the same. And some near death experiences, when they talk about their testimony, I say, wait a minute, you told me that this happened and then this. And they said, no, there's no order that it happened in. It was all simultaneous. List. They say uh, maybe a panoramic thing happening. And uh, probably the the, the analogy that helped me kind of get a little bit of a clue was that of the old projectors. So we're constantly shifting our reality. So when I do this with my hand, I've just created several billion different realities. And this was one reality of me, like a fixed frame, and there's another one of the next. And so it's like a little fixed frame of a film projector. And you can look at all the frames. Okay, so yeah, no time. I think that's another one where you've got to experience it. I, I don't get it. <laughs> so I'm not going to spend much time trying to answer that one because I, I really don't get it. That, that analogy helped though. That helped. Thank you very much. 
So, Greg? Greg? Hey, hey. Yeah, hi. There I am. Hi, Greg. <laughs> hey, okay. Um, so, we hear about how we create the reality around here. What I struggle a lot with, first, I'm just going to open up and say I struggle with anxiety and I can't control it. It's just my brain goes worst case scenario regardless. It's just, you know, I don't know how to solve that. I don't know if you guys have the answer to that. But the, the other thing is, is I think about the world and um, how are the people in Ukraine creating their reality? I mean, are they all collectively thinking these things? You know, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're being their lives are being destroyed right now as we speak. And let's not talk about the, the other side of that too. Lives are being destroyed. And, and I just can't imagine that being a, a reality being created and, you know, by self. And I don't know if anybody has any insight on any of these things. Okay. So situations like a war, if enough people have the consciousness to do it, it's not every individual exactly 100 percent creating their own reality like my reality has nothing in common with the rest of people on earth you know my sky is red and the grass is yellow it's not like that so it is interactive we're collectively creating the reality people know souls know the potentials before they come down here so what there's some pre signing that happens you generally choose your gender you choose your parents a lot of people were shown that they chose their parents. And there's probably some people listening to this going, I chose my parents? What the heck was I thinking? Well, from a soul perspective, you are our souls are far wiser than our little brains are here on Earth. Um, so everybody who's here is, I would say, creating their own mystery, but they're a, they're a willing participant in those potentials. Okay, so somebody might choose a life, uh, you know, that they're going to be, you know, they were a soldier during World War II. They were shown there's a high potential you're going to be killed at 20 years old. They might accept that as a condition of that lifetime. Okay, I'm going to experience a lifetime as a, a young man who grows to 20 and dies in the war. I'm going to experience that. And they can come back and do another lifetime. So, again, what appears to be a horrible tragedy is not quite that way on the other side of the veil uh, quite a few near-death experiences told me what we see as a great success sometimes is a miserable failure to heaven and what we see as a miserable failure can be seen as a great success to them so they have a bird's eye view and perspective that we don't i mean if you're going to decide to climb mount everest you know that there's going to be some suffering and maybe some unexpected challenges and you might die and some do die climbing it but again you know you can try it next lifetime around again <laughs> you know i mean how bad is it if you just keep coming back as many times as you want and you don't have to come back you don't have to, have to come back here so everybody's a willing participant everybody is aware and death usually by something like a war that's something they almost certainly had pre-planning with their souls. So most most deaths are planned in the manner that it's going to happen. Um, but it's like a vacation itinerary, okay? You know, there's this whole argument of free will versus versus predetermination, right? Well, which is it? Well, it's both. When you go on vacation somewhere, is that vacation predetermined, predestined, or do you have free will? Well, both. You might change some of your plans. You might change some of the things you were planning on seeing, but part of it was predestined. You had planned on doing it, and part of it was you making decisions. So just like a vacation itinerary, you can always choose to change your plan down here. You're free to do that. Does that help? Perhaps. I mean, what if I suffering over there or elsewhere is that even possible i'm sorry I, I, can you say that again so my reality if i wanted to end uh, the needed suffering somewhere even even uh 
the wars or whatever, is that even possible or is it's a collective thing, it sounds like? Um, I think it's both. I think it's the individual experiencing it and the collective. Did you have um, a kind of chaotic childhood where it was a difficult childhood? I don't know why. Uh, why why you ask that? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> but that I'm can just cause some anxiety. Certainly, I can follow you. Uh, no, it's it's genetic. Um, oh, okay. uh, generalized okay. anxiety uh, runs in my my father, my brother. They we have it, and uh, you know, um, it, it's it's weird. We're talking earlier at the at the start of this about the uh, honorary NDEs. I'm an honorary NDE. <laughs> because i've always questioned reality i've always questioned you know religion and all this but i found that it gives me hope that you know it, it gives me hope but in a way i feel like i cling to it in a way too and, and maybe in an unhealthy way maybe not I maybe mean, it's a discussion for a different time you know i, I don't think it, i don't think something like this is going to be unhealthy for you all right this is giving us strange stuff but um I have heard a few things from the other side of the veil that may address your issue. So quantum energy can imprint onto DNA and it could get passed down to generations. So you may be working through some anxiety that was a result of quantum energy imprinted on DNA of your ancestors. And it, it may be one of your goals that you decided to deal with this and help work through all this. So that whole game of, of dropping down, going to fear, and then finding the love again, that's strengthening us, you know? The weightlifter's muscles down, up, fear, love. And so you might be part of this big step up, you know, from the love. I'm pulling away from that anxiety that was built in the past. It, so it may not have anything to do with your life or even your dad's life or, or grandparents' life or mother's life. It may be three or four generations back and it was so traumatic you're still working through it i, I don't know but I've, I've heard that it imprints on dna definitely because our dna has a quantum multi-dimensional aspect to it um okay kathy uh angela has a question here it says can kathy please repeat the name of the book on the vibration of food please Kathy? Uh, yeah, it's Power Versus Force. I don't remember who wrote it, but it's Power Versus Force. Thank you. It's now, what I was going to say before in, in response to your talk about the frequencies of food and so forth, Nikola Tesla, the father of modern electricity, and you had inventions way before his time, decades before his time, he even predicted uh, cell phones and things like that. He said, if you want to understand the universe, Think in terms of energy, vibration, and frequency. I mean, that stuff's real. And I have heard from the other side of the veil that growing your own food is very important because your frequency affects the food's frequency, and that food will tailor itself for your body and your needs. Wow. And so even if you're growing a little bit of food, if it's nothing more than, you know, you live in a tiny apartment in the big city, if it's nothing more than a little pot with some parsley in there and something else you know grow a little bit of your own food and eat it it's supposed to be very good for you. Oh, thank you jack you had your hand up okay this is a quick question david um in your interviews uh, or hearing the 700 yeah. ndes etc you said that they had a, a, a they had a 360 degrees vision now you know i mean we, we've got like 180 at the most but um is this 360 actually they're seeing seeing things 360 degrees all around them or is it an awareness of everything around them people in the higher levels, it's probably just a, an awareness that's far better than vision. But in the lower levels, they're kind of laid out like Earth. They describe actually seeing all around them. And they still do what we do, where we've got this big field of vision and we're focusing on one thing. 
Uh, and then they can zoom in as well. So they can look at a flower petal on a mountain 50 miles away and zoom in and see the cells of the, of the petals. But yeah, it's, it's uh, the way I've heard it described, it's actual vision. But it's probably both. I mean, it's probably in that realm that the two are probably the same thing. Okay, thank you, you again. Uh, so, okay, so next is Donna. Hi, Donna. Put your sound on, Donna. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, um, I was just going to say I, I had to leave to, to, unfortunately, to go to a different meeting. Uh, but um, I came in on the tail end of what you're talking about as uh, food is energy and stuff. And as someone who studies Qigong and uh, Chinese healing, uh, as well as uh, being a Reiki master, I understand that, you know, part of what I do is to put uh, energy into something that, you know, will continue to keep going as uh you know like a blanket or uh or something else that the person can put over the place that needs to heal uh so energy goes where it, where intent is if you intend it to do something it will do it uh you just have to try not to block it with your consciousness um but one thing you can also do is to put energy into your water each day and tell it to give you healing vibes or open a particular meridian or things like that. Re Reiki people can uh, do that all the time. Uh, or you can, when you bless your food, you can, you can pray that this, this food gives you abundant healing, et cetera, and that your body absorb the nutrients from this that are going to heal, that are, you are gonna heal you. Uh, so the biggest thing I can see as far as, you know, eating goes, eat things that give you chi or energy. Uh, if you, if you eat dead things, you're going to be, you're not going to get as much. And I'm not saying don't eat meat. I'm saying, uh, you know, eat those things that are going to give you life giving energy. So in other words, clean up your diet, less processed, more whole foods. Yeah, thank you. I learned some things there. Appreciate that. Very good. Okay, uh, Laurie. Yes, just a couple of quick things. Um, uh, based on the diet, that is how I healed myself. I completely eat organic, grass-fed, halal food for two years straight. I never let an ounce of sugar go past my body or any kind of uh, uh, manufactured food. I eat, and I still eat this way. And it was how I recovered and healed. And I listened to a lot of um, uh, NDE podcasts or whatever, and I, I get certain things from them. And one of the recent things that I heard that has kind of helped me with, um, any kind of depression or suffering I'm going through because we all have our own issues was that this person had a conversation with Jesus and Jesus told them that he needed to just show love more to the people that he encounters, pray more because I do believe our prayers are heard. And the third thing was suffer joyfully. So I've been actually thinking about this as I go through, uh, through about my day, these three things that I can do, I can show love to others, I can pray, and I can suffer joyfully because we're, we all have our, our suffering. So these, these uh, things I recently heard have kind of helped me to, um, to uh, realize that there is a lot of suffering and that, you know, if we did choose to come here to do it, we might as well do it joyfully. So thank you again, David, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so before we, uh, I do the, the guided meditation, I want to thank you, uh, David, for this wonderful presentation. All the way from Texas. All of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I you hope you stay for the meditation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And we will place your... Uh, website the book information on our website well, as soon as uh, we we prepare the, the video so thank you david all right so now i'm going to be doing the um 
this uh, very short, it's a gratitude meditation script. And I got this from uh, change to chill.org. So anybody can access all their meditations. This is for building resilience muscle through gratitude in this meditation. Just breathe. Take some time to place yourself in a comfortable position. Take a few deep breaths and let your chest rise and fall with each inhalation and exhalation. And breathe. When you're ready, let your eyes drift close. As you continue to breathe slowly and deeply, let your attention rest gently in your breath, feeling the moment, mo the movement as it enters and it exits your body. Each time you exhale, let the let it go of any tension. Relax your face, your shoulders, your belly, your legs, and breathe. On your next exhale, settle your attention to the area around your heart. Focus on the feelings of love, compassion, empathy, forgiveness. When your attention on your heart center, bring to mind something or someone you are grateful for. As you continue with your easy, relaxed breathing, perhaps you feel gratitude for being alive or healthy. Perhaps you are grateful for the abundance of nature that produces food to nourish your body and beautiful scenery to nourish your soul. Bring your attention to people who truly nourish you in your life and how they bless you with their presence. And breathe. Feel gratitude for your own life and the many gifts you have been blessed with. Now, bring your attention to how this gratitude feels in the area around your heart with each exhale inhale let this feeling grow outward expanding to fill your chest your arms and hands your legs and feet with each inhale this feeling grows filling you up and breathe and now even as your turn return your attention to your breath let your body remember the sensations of your gratitude thank you thank you all for being thank here you. with me this evening appreciate you have a restful restful sleep and see you next month thank, thank you thank you thank you all so much bye take care blessings to everyone thank you